Let us now listen to God's word as we prepare ourselves for this morning worship service. Come now, and let us reason together, serve the Lord. They shall be white, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. So let us now spend a minute or so in silent prayer as we seek God's face and seek His blessings. Let us pray. Let us sing the Lord is in His holy temple. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are His, and He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and set up kings. He gave up wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Let us um, sing our first hymn, opening hymn, Blessed be the name. Let us arise from where you are, join our hearts, praise God and worship Him. as we look to the Lord in prayer. God and eternal Heavenly Father, we praise and bless your holy name. For Lord, we acknowledge that thou art the true and living God, 
the creator of the heavens and earth. And by your name, all ye shall bow and worship. Because there is no other gods than you, the true and living God, whom, Lord, we are able to call thee Abba, our Father. And the Lord, we have a blessed relationship with you. But Lord, Lord, by your name, that we can gather in this simple manner in church and also virtually to worship you. When you, Lord, thou art worthy of all our worship for who you are, Lord, the eternal one, the unchangeable one, the all-powerful one, who is loving, and just, holy, and perfect in all your ways. And the Lord, that we can truly call, um, come unto you and adore you and to give thee all glory and all honor. Father, Lord, into our hearts and cleanse us from every unrighteousness and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us, to bear our sins, our sorrows, that he was by your stripes that we are healed, the bruise for our iniquities. How great, Lord, the love of Jesus for each one of us, to those who call upon you, to those who believe in his name. So, Father, we pray that our worship in this simple manner, the Lord, that you will bring glory to you, and the Lord, our hearts be quietened as we so listen to your word, and shared by Deacon Stephen Yeo. The Lord, you bless our hearts, and your name will be glorified in our worship. So continue to lead us and guide us. And dear Lord, it is good to be in the house of the Lord and to worship you in spirit and in truth. For we give you all glory and honor. We pray all this in the blessed name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, please be seated. Good morning and a bit one and all, a very well welcome to Harrow BB Church Worship Service, uh, 27 September 2020. So on behalf of the church session, a bit one and all, grace and mercy from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ as we worship Him in church and also online. This morning we're going to sing two songs, songs of assurance as we live in this uh, troublous time, as we the battle the pandemic as an individual, as a church, and as a nation. A blessed assurance and my faith looks up to thee. Now Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, the author admonished us. Let us draw near with a true heart of faith in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure blood. And also daily we live by faith and not by sight, trusting God. Blessed Assurance.
scripture reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1 to 17. Now I invite Master Micaiah to read God's word to us. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 to 17. Exodus 20 chapter, uh, verse 1 And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the, hand, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is, that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the day which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Verse 17, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. May the Lord bless the reading of His Holy Word. This morning we are glad to have our, with us um, Deacon Stephen Yeo to preach God's Word to us. His message is entitled, Serve No Other Gods. Deacon Stephen. A very blessed morning to every one of you who are present here physically, as well as those that are worshipping at home. Most of us, if not all, are very familiar with the Ten Commandments okay, that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai when he led the Israelites out of Egypt thousand year of years ago. When reading the scripture text this morning, we are once again reminded what the Ten Commandments is all about. He is telling his people what to do and what not to do. When I was preparing this morning message and have read this passage a few times, it actually prompted me to think about our, my relationship with God. We go to the next slides. How serious is our relationship with God? Do we treat God as God? Or do we treat him as a God Almighty? Or that we also treat him as the Supreme One? Or that he's someone that can be there or cannot be there or do not need to be there? What kind of relationship do we want to have with God? I think these are the questions that many of us should be asking ourselves today. Are we having him, the relationship on a needs basis? When I need him, then he's there. Or when I'm happy, or when um, all goes well, okay, I might not need him at all. So what is your relationship with God today? Do you know that we as human beings are defined by our relationship more than anything else? Relationships tell us who we are, whose we are, and what is expected of us. Our relationship also defines where we have been, where we are, and also where we are going. Throughout the Bible, 
it's easy to see a few selected people who are so clearly defined of their relationship with God. In Genesis 6, we actually look at Noah. It's defined by who he wasn't. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, David was defined by who he had replaced. And in John chapter 18, Peter was defined by who he followed. So, let's look at what defined us. In Exodus, we know that God had put the Ten Commandments as the binding rules for the living, for the people, so that they are in order, they have the peace. They are not just a list of commandments given to the Jews thousands of years ago, okay, but they are a standard of living that applies to all people in all places at all times. They are commandments that God expects us to keep in our everyday lives. God brought Israel out of Egypt, as you read, so that they might keep the very commands that he had given them beginning with the first commandment, which is in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, do not have other gods before me. At the same time, the sinfulness of their hearts were exposed by the commandments that God had given them. The commands demanded not only an external obedience, but at the same time, it also an obedience of the heart. God alone is worthy of their love as well as their worship. No other God had saved them. No other God could uphold them. And with no other God could be the God Almighty that shared their affection as well as loyalty. In today's message, which I title, Serve No Other Gods, which is a small g, I hope that the points that I will be sharing with you will make us to rethink our relationship with God and also the potential to help us to live holier lives for the glory of God. There are three components that I want to talk about today. Number one, which is God's requirement. The statement of verse 3 is very simple and clear. God simply said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. While this statement may sound simple and clean, it is also at the same time a very strong statement. In every culture operating in the world at that time, okay, were polytheistic. They all recognized and worshipped a multiplicity of gods. In verse 2, God reminded the Israel that he had delivered them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is a reminder that they had delivered from slavery. But it is also a reminder of much more. The Egyptians, like all other cultures around them, they worship many gods. They give their lives and their love to all sorts of man-made gods, represented by idols and animals. They had a sun god, a water god, a moon god, a snake god, a flock god, and a fly god, and many more. When God delivered Israel from that country, He also delivered them from the influence of the pagan system of worship. When these commandments we have read today that were given, Israel was on their way to a place called Canaan. When they arrived there, they could encounter a race of people who worship many gods. If Israel was not settled on the idea that God alone was God, they would be in trouble in the very heart of their spiritual lives. Of all the nations on the earth in those days, only Israel is monotheistic. That is, they had one God and his name is Jehovah. That was to be their primary identification. They were to be the people of God serving him and worshipping him alone. And in verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God 
is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy hearts, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. When God tells them to have no other gods, it does not mean that God recognizes any other deity beside him. He knows that there are no other gods, and God is not making room in the universe for other gods. He is simply declaring that he is God alone. The word God, the small g, in our, te in our text here, it means ruler, judge, or lord. The true God knew that no other gods existed, but he also knew that anything that received the supreme love, adoration, worship, and service of the people would eventually become their lord. It could, in essence, become their god. That is why he said, Thou shalt have no other god before me. The phrase before me literally means over against me or before my face. In other words, God wanted no other god love, no other love, okay, no other allegiance, no other authority to come between himself and his redeemed people. Our grace to be only his face alone and not in the face of another God. God is a jealous God and he will tolerate no other gods in the lives of his people, which explained in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Look at the history of Israel. It's clear that they had a tendency to accumulate other gods. And they were continuing allow the gods of the pagans or their own selfishness to become and to come before the true and living God. They constantly suffer because their failure in that area. We too, in today's context, have the same tendency. We need to understand that anything that rules us is a God in our lives. Martin Luther had said, Whatever thy heart clings to or relies upon, that is properly thy God. Anything that is allowed to control any part of our lives is a God. It might be pleasure, family, career, or dreams, possessions, money, sports, people, or anything else that you can name. If it is ever allowed to come before your relationship with God, or the, or the God Almighty, it is a God to you. If we really want to, to know something about the real God in our lives, okay, look at where you spend your time, your money, and what is your affection in your heart. Those three things, time, money, affection, are the true indicators of who is the Lord and God of your life. The first part of this commandment, which is the first commandment, uh, verse 3, okay, might seem a bit negative. Nothing in life is to be allowed to become a competitor with God for first place in our hearts and lives. He is God, and He is God alone. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, it reminded us, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and make it, He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. So let's go to the second portion. We let's talk about God's right. The reason that God possesses the right to make such a demand for his people is found in verse 2. He says, I am the Lord thy God. In this statement, God declared his identity. The word Lord identified him as the sovereign, the almighty, and also the supreme. It also identifies him 
as the self-existent one. It reminds us that he is the I am. It declares him to be the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God of creation. Revelation as well as salvation. Because that is who he is. No mere God of human origin should ever be allowed to supplant him in our lives. There is no God ever devised by the wisdom of the man that can do anything, any of the things he can do. In Isaiah ch chapter 46, verse 5 to 7, it also again reminds us and tells us this. To whom will ye lighten me and make me equal and compare me that we might, may be light? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder, they carry him and set him in his place and he standeth from his place shall he not remove. Yea, one shall cry unto him, yet can he not answer, nor save him out of his trouble. God has the right to make this demand of his people because his, uh, his identity as God. But he also possesses the right because of his love to his people. He delivered them out of Egypt and from their slavery in that land. He purchased them to himself through the blood of the innocent Passover lamb. He owned them and he had the right to do as he pleased with them. He also delivered them from the influence of the false gods of Egypt. The same reason stands today. God is the same God he has ever been. He is still the Lord thy God. He has the right to demand absolute obedience to his will and his word because he owns us. He purchased us to himself through the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He owned us and he possesses all rights to our lives. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He also delivered us from the influence of the false gods of this world. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, How bad then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. One more point for us to consider. When the Lord say, I am the Lord thy God, that phrase is in the second person singular. That statement speaks of God as being in a personal relationship with each and every one of his redeemed people. He is the Lord thy God. If that is true, then we must never allow anything to come before him and become a God in our life. Let's go to the third part, God's reality. The main point that I've been pondering on today is this. When we maintain the spirit of this first commandment, he, we will then not break the other nine commandments. When the first commandment is the co controlling force of our daily lives, our primary goal in life will be to glorify God with our lives. Jesus Christ simplified and he condensed the thought and make it even simpler to grasp. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40, and it says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, hand all the law and the prophets. So when we love the Lord 
with all our hearts and being, there will be no danger of our having any other God before Him. When He is first in our love, first in our life, and first in our affection, then the Spirit of the Lord will be lived out in every thought and action of our lives. Israel failed to keep this commandment, and they went after other gods. As a result, what happened to them? They were chastened and judged by God every time. The same will happen in our lives when we allow other gods or other loves to take his place in our hearts. Let's go to the next slide. When we allow this first commandment to become the overriding reality of our hearts, we will find that all the other commandments will fall in place. Let's open our Bible once again, okay, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 17. Uh, we'll go through each of these commandments. In verse 4, the second commandment is about worship. When we love the Lord supremely, we will worship Him correctly. The third commandment in verse 7 is about honoring God's name. When we love Him as we should, we will never do anything that will bring dishonor to His name. The fourth commandment is about honoring God's right to control even the daily life events of our life in verse 8 to 10. When He is the primary love of our hearts, we rest because He rested. And we will worship Him in all of our life because He demands it. The fifth commandment is in verse 12 is about respecting parents. When God holds the proper place in our hearts, we will honour the authorities that God has placed over us in our lives. The sixth commandment is about the sanity of human life, which is stated in verse 13. When God is first in our lives, we will love others like He loves them, and we will have no room for hatred or murder in our hearts. The seventh commandment is the sanity of the marriage relationship, which stated in verse 14. When God is first in our heart, we will not use our bodies in a way that dishonor Him or our spouse. When God is first in our affections, sexual sin will not be a problem. The eighth commandment is about the sanity of the property of others which is in verse 15. When God is first, we will not take that which belongs to others. And the nine commandments in verse 16 is about the sanity of truth. When God is first, we will be like Him. And since He is a God who cannot lie, we will also be marked by the truth. And let's go to the tenth commandments in verse 17. Okay? which is about contentment. When God is first in our hearts, we will be content with the things He brings into our lives. And we will not seek to look upon the blessing of others with jealous or lust. When God is demoted in our hearts and we love other things and other people more than Him, we set those things up as gods in our lives. When we do, we are in violation of the first commandment and we stand guilty before the Lord. When I allow anything to take his place as number one, I have stolen the glory from God and I'm in sin. So this commandment comes before the others because they all flow from this one. Everything must flow from God or it will fail. Everything must flow from God or it will end in sin. Everything must flow from God or he will not be able to bless it. And here is how Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added unto you. It is not scratch of the scripture to say that if I can love the Lord above all, above all and in spite of all, I have no problem living for Him. The problem with sin is always a problem in the heart. It is always a problem of love. When I break the Lord's commandment, it is because I love myself more than I love Him. I think the next thing that I want to talk about is really go into, can anyone achieve in meeting God's expectation as stated in the first commandments? Is it easy to do or is it very hard to do? In the Bible, we see that Noah, Moses, David, as well as Paul, and many others had demonstrated their love for God, their obedience to God, and also their commitments to God. For Paul, for example, he has said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is very single-minded as he expressed the following statement, for one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So do we find anyone in the 20th and 21st century that had achieved this? Let's go to the next slide. So beside the Old Testament, I'm going to bring some examples of the current, okay? In the early 1900s, we actually see that John Sun, okay, in Chinese, Song San Jie, He's a very popular uh, missionary. Okay. John Soon, despite the array of career opportunities, he had many degrees, he got doctorates and so forth. He's very qualified academically. Okay. He had a lot of career opportunity in front of him with great okay, ac academic achievement. But what did he do? He believed that he was called by God to commit himself to work for Jesus Christ. So when he returned to China in 1927, he actually threw all his academic awards into the sea, only keeping the doctorate diploma for his father. This action he intended to signify his full commitments to the gospel. He played an instrumental role in the revival movement among the Chinese, okay, in mainland China, in Taiwan, as well as Southeast Asia during the 1920s as well as the 1930s. For John, two things are very specific in his life. Number one, he loved God and placed God above everything else. And number two, he loved the Bible and sought to obey it above all things else. Let's bring someone locally, okay, and that is Dr. Bobby Sun. And he's a Singaporean. Dr. Sun leave for mission only a year after graduating as a doctor. His life of 83 years was lived in the fullness for God as he served in many different ministerial capacities. The impact he had on those he taught was not about his knowledge of God or the word of God, but how he lived it up. His life was that of a godly role model. The third example is Mr. Jim Chu. Okay, um, both uh, Dr. Sung as well as Jim Chu actually passed away last year yeah, and called home. And for Jim Chu, since young, he thought that he might end up okay, in a bank or to teach economics. But he knew it was most important to be where God wanted him to be. He also knew it was important to follow Jesus than simply attend church on Sunday. And this is his, uh, what he says. A sense of God-given vocation is so important. And above all, I knew that Jesus was Lord of all. I think this really uh, is really for us to ponder, to pray about. Are we able to relook at the, our relationship with God? 
and how we want to actually adhere to the calling of what God wants us to be. So in conclusion, we can worship any God we please. We can serve self or we can serve sin or we can serve pleasure or we can serve greed. We can serve the God of false religion but if we are going to live the lives that are blessed by God, then we must be no other gods before Him. He must be first because He will not stand to be second. He must be first because He will not bless those who follow other gods to come before Him. There is this hymn okay, that says, our hearts are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. So day by day, we need to be reminded of God's unfailing love for us in Christ. We also need to walk in newness of life, in loving obedience towards God, by keeping Him first in our hearts. We are Christ's church, and in Him we have been washed within and love. What has the Lord revealed about your relationship with Him today? Has He shown you that there is some other God that has taken His place? Today would be a good day to get our spiritual priorities in place. Has He shown you that you are lost? If so, then today will be a great day to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. You can begin your personal relationship with God by putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Let us pray. Dear Father, gracious God, we thank you so much for reminding us about the Ten Commandments, but more importantly, reminding us the first commandment that there shall be no other gods before you. Dear Lord, help us to prioritize our life, help us to relook our relationship with you, and help us to continue to seek thy will in all that we do. And more important, dear Lord, help us to love you with all our hearts, with all our mind, and with all our soul. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Indeed, we thank God for this morning's uh, message given by Deacon Stephen Yeo. Truly, we are reminded of God's requirement, God's right, God's reality, and respond. It is for us to love our God with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Okay, the end of the worship service. God bless you. Thank you.